Okay, thanks everyone for joining today and welcome to another Credit Watch webinar. It's been a bit of time since we ran the last one with everything going on in the financial year, et cetera. Uh, we wanted to save some, some big data insights um, and obviously a lot of you would have seen the release of our playbook for financial year 2021, which will um, obviously complement today's webinar very nicely as we look ahead with data-driven insights. Before we get started today, of course, plenty going on in the world with Corona, a lot going on with you know, credit risk, insolvencies, um, government stimulus, et cetera. Now, we could, I could happily talk for hours on it. I've tried to be concise. Um, I've tried not to give away all of the information that is in the, the playbook that I hope you've all had a look at or, or will be able to download very soon. Um, I, I encourage you to ask questions and I will, I will time pending get to those questions at the end of the webinar. Um, and of course, as always, we are recording today's webinar. So we will send you a copy of the recording and the presentation as well. A little bit about Credit Watch. Australia is leading the most innovative commercial credit reporting bureau with over 50,000 customers across Australia, from small business, sole traders, all the way up to the biggest companies in Australia utilising our data, our insights and our technology and features. A wide variety of uh, products that we have, of course, in our product suite, Credit Watch being the core product, looking at credit reporting, credit risk, uh, credit scores, payment predictor, showing how debtors pay their bills, monitoring alerts, etc. cetera. Debtalogic, Gives you a better understanding of your accounts receivable ledger. So it will look at and analyze your age trial balance, compare how you're being paid by debtors versus how those debtors are paying their other suppliers. Director due diligence looks at the individuals behind a company and will provide alerts on cross directorship changes, really important for addressing or identifying Phoenix activity. PlayEasy is our online credit application and automated decisioning solution. If you want to do away with your paper-based PDF credit application, click on that link or chat to us about getting into the 21st century and utilising an online solution. PPSR logic, anything PPSR related, registrations, discharges, amendments, etc. PPSR logic is an award-winning platform for you to use and it integrates with Creditor Watch and Apply Easy. In times like this, we cannot stress how important having security is. We know that there's an increase in insolvencies coming. If you can have security, um, that is certainly better than lining up with the other unsecured creditors. Financial risk assessments, great for assessing um, bigger ticket items, bigger deals, regardless of whether that's you know, credit or on the supply side, looking at it from a procurement perspective, um, we'll actually assess the financials of a company for you in a really comprehensive report. Portfolio Health Check, the last one there, providing a review of your database. Um, great to not only update you know, your marketing database, your sales database, um, however, importantly, it's a really good way to assess the credit risk that exists in your portfolio and your accounts receivables and we can actually put a credit score against every single customer you're doing business with or potentially you just want to identify the high risk ones that you probably shouldn't be dealing with just at the moment. So looking at today's agenda, new financial year, new financial rules, plenty of new things out there. We'll have a quick look at the road to administration that we've talked about in the past. Um, I'll touch on economy being in a better position than expected. Obviously, it's not in a great position, but it's certainly in a better position than most people anticipated back in March um, when Corona really started to rear its ugly head. External administration analysis will also look at payment default trends. Um, we did a survey recently of Credit Watch customers, some really interesting insights coming out of there, particularly when you compare it to other surveys being run by other organisations. Of course, we'll look at some payment times as well by industry. So I've put a little bit of context in here. We know that um, we're, we're in a, 
you know, national economic crisis. It's a recession. It's uh, far worse than the GFC in 08, 09. And it's certainly going to affect the economy and most people, most sectors, most industries for decades to come. At the time of actually writing it, um, they suggest, the estimates suggested that the unemployment rate would peak in December at 9.25%, um, which if you think about it, you know, one in 10 people being out of work is a, is a disaster. Um, certainly not something um, that anyone is, is looking forward to dealing with. Um, however, being upfront and um, transparent is really important. I think the government has done a fairly good job of that, particularly as everything is moving so quickly. So new financial year, new financial rules. There's obviously a whole number of things out there that the government and the banks in particular, jumping on board Team Australia, have gotten involved. So we've got those loan deferral schemes in place. They're all in place. Um, if you have chosen to take up, um, uh, chosen to defer a loan, whether it's your home loan or a, or a commercial loan, in place until September, most of the banks have indicated that they're willing to extend that for another six months. However, it will more than likely be means tested from October onwards, just like the government has introduced or updated us that JobKeeper and JobSeeker um, would be extended. JobKeeper, of course, will be much more um, uh, will looked at from a revenue perspective rather than a forecasting perspective. So you will have to prove that you are still eligible for JobKeeper, much the same as uh, those loan deferrals as well. We've seen JobSeeker play a big part, JobMaker be introduced. Um, and of course, the big ones for me, Safe Harbour and the insolvency legislation changes that have taken place that were introduced in March and are due to come to an end towards the end of September, big, big, Question mark there is, will they, won't they extend those? And of course, in all of everything, with everything that's going on, um, the DIN or director identification number and the modernization of um, the business registers, which is 30 odd registers that are administered at the moment by states and ASIC and whatnot coming together under a single register administered by the ATO. Now that was initially due to be released or launched in 2021, of course, with uh, COVID-19, um, that's more than likely to be pushed back. However, the fact that it has been passed, legislation has been passed, is a really, really important first step towards that modernisation project taking place. And of course, the director identification number making it much easier to identify the same director across multiple companies, um, which will make it much more difficult for things like Phoenix activity to take place, fraud, or for direct directors to simply sort of disappear and, and utilise a, a similar name, similar birth date, similar address um, as a director of another company with no connection to failed companies. The road to administration, this is something that Creditor Watch coined a number of years ago, and it looks at the, the, the breadcrumbs, the, the, the indicators, the markers that a debtor leaves as they head towards administration. We know that the first thing that comes, first thing that happens is they slow their payment of bills, their payment of invoices, typically to smaller suppliers, SME suppliers, before it starts to affect larger, more critical uh, creditors that they will have. The next step is payment defaults are registered by smaller non-critical suppliers. So when I say non-critical supplier, if I'm, a, if I'm a business and I've got a bunch of invoices to pay, I'm going to pay my landlord, I'm going to pay you know, my loan, I'm going to pay the, the accounting software or the POS system that runs my business. They're critical suppliers and non-critical ones are people like printers, someone that delivers, you know, potentially, um, you know, food to the company, um, uh, small things that they can either shop around for or do without. So we see that those defaults are registered by smaller suppliers. And of course, the majority of Creditor Watch's customers are SME, certainly falling into that non-critical supplier stage. The next step is payment defaults being registered by larger critical suppliers. Of course, they've got dedicated 
resources, AR teams, lawyers, etc., even debt collection. They've got processes in place. Um, so they're generally better at collecting money and or a more critical supplier, therefore um, have a bit more leverage. After that, we likely will see a mercantile inquiry or debt collection action. Debtor then is taken to court. And of course, next steps are insolvency, whether it's a wind up VA or administration liquidation. And then of course, end of the road as the company is deregistered. So obviously keep that in mind as we go through today's presentation. So a quick one here, flattening the insolvency curve. Now it's somewhat of a mirage. I think we can all be honest. We know, um, we know that administrations are down significantly and we know that the debtor's journey to administration has somewhat slowed, though there is probably a realistic fear that um, because of everything that is going on, uh, debtors will most likely skip a number of steps between slowing payments and heading into administration. So just looking at payment defaults for the second quarter, we're down by 3.7% versus Q1, um, but have risen 3.5% on an annual basis. Court actions dropped 32% year on year. So if you're comparing Q2 2020 to Q2, um, 2019, a 32% drop, 25% um, drop between the first and second quarters this calendar year as well. Now, if you looked at that as a historical footnote, you'd say, okay, that's interesting. You know, the economy was doing well, people were paying their bills. But when you step back and take a look at the greater scheme of things, you understand that there's a reason that they've dropped. You know, we've had insolvency legislation changes, so statutory demands been put off, uh, don't have to be responded to for, for up to six months in an insolvency. Um, many courts are either closed or running significantly behind schedule. Um, and of course, something that we've seen with natural disasters like floods and fires in the past is that Aussie creditors tend to take a very lenient approach to debtors. Um, they are gentle. They want to nurse people through it which is great to see. And to be honest, we kind of expected to see an increase in defaults um, around June. However, that still hasn't occurred. Even through July, looking at the results this morning, we haven't seen an increase. So it will be interesting to see if and when creditors um, get to the point where they want to start registering defaults um, and ultimately you know, pushing the, the debtor along um, that, that path to administration. Looking at the payment defaults month on month, um, we can see there has been you know, an upward trend over the last two years. So this goes back to July 2018. However, looking at the last sort of five months, um, there was an uptick sort of through to uh, March, April, and then a significant reduction. You know, we're coming down to you know, December, Jan numbers, which are obviously always low. Um, when you compare, given the fact that most people are, you know, on holiday, so they're not registering those defaults. So a huge uh, decrease in the number of defaults. Um, and as I said, yet to sort of pick up, um, it will be interesting to see if and when that does happen. Looking at external administrations month on month as well, similar sort of story. Um, this time, an overall trend down, which we know that's going back to June 2018, um, we can see that there's obviously Jan, a bit of a drop off, um, which is expected. However, it has just continued to drop from March through April, May, June, July. And we know that that is a result of really two things. We know that there are zombie businesses out there. So they are companies that would normally have gone into administration are simply not going into administration, whether it's you know VA, for example, they are taking advantage of the government stimulus package to, to hibernate and either wait out and see if they have a chance or, or there's complete naivety there and, and they, they just refuse to um, put their company into administration. There's, there's obviously a very emotional um, attachment, particularly for small business owners to companies, even if the right thing and the writing is on the wall saying, you know, there isn't a future here. The fact that we've had the insolvency legislation changes. And of course, the second thing there, the safe harbor um, rules come in. 
people are just simply putting off um, the inevitable. There is a large portion of companies out there. We're looking at you know between sort of three and six hundred a month that are simply not going into administration that normally would in any you know normal year. You then add on top of that the companies that have certainly been affected by COVID um, that would prop that would push those numbers up even further as a result of the safe harbour legislation, they are not going into administration either. So we're seeing this, this, this big drop in the number of administrations taking place. And we can see July is going to be the lowest on record for a very, very long time, which is masking the true sort of economic impact out there. Um, if you look at Q2 2020, fell by 36% when you compare it to 2019. Um, and then July 2019 to July 2020, it's almost 50%. Okay, so that's starting to give you an understanding of how many companies out there are, are put off, are uh, zombie, are uh, hibernating, whatever you want to call it, um, that ultimately will go into administration. You know, these if COVID didn't exist, these, these companies would still go into administration eventually, all right, plus the COVID-affected ones. Um, there's certainly going to be a huge increase in administrations. Um, Australia gets sort of, you know, between eight and nine and a half thousand administrations um, a year. And at the moment, we're sitting on about sort of 1,500 to 2,000 that haven't gone into administration that normally would, plus COVID affected ones. So there's certainly going to be a significant increase. Um, in the future and the single most important factor in that will be, in my opinion, not the um, reduction or elimination of, of JobKeeper, it will be um, the safe harbour legislation and when safe harbour, the moratorium on safe harbour provisions are removed, that is when we will start to see company directors um, either pull their head out of the sand or realise, okay, I'm not going to get out of this and if I don't do the right thing, um, ASIC are obviously going to come after me. Something that's really important to note is that directors taking on debt, um, knowing they have no chance of paying that in the future, will not necessarily be protected by um, the safe harbour provisions that have been introduced. On top of that, I believe from April um, this year, directors became personally liable for any GST um, that was owed to the government as well. So um, everyone needs to sort of keep that in mind, whether you are a, a, a debtor or, you know, the director of a, a company that is struggling or a creditor who is chasing, it's important to remember those things um, because it could actually assist in collecting that outstanding money, particularly obviously if you're a, uh, a creditor in that case. So looking at um, the Creditor Watch survey that we ran back in July, some really interesting numbers coming out of this. 94% of businesses say they would be able to survive until the end of the year without government support, which was a lot more than we certainly anticipated internally. 92% um, think that they would, be, would have avoided insolvency even without safe harbour provisions. 52% have been receiving JobKeeper versus 47% that have not. So some really interesting numbers there coming out of the survey. Some um, anecdotal sort of commentary from a, a couple of customers that we wanted to add in here. One from uh, one in the construction industry, no significant change. The poor payers have continued to be slow. Good payers have continued to pay on time once lockdown restrictions were eased. We've been very cautious granting credit, continued to our policy of putting customers on hold when chasing outstanding payment. What's interesting is the construction industry generally, you know, an industry that we would we would rank as, you know, sort of top three riskiest, top three slowest payments. They, they seem to be doing better um, in comparison to, to most of the other, most other industries. And I, I guess the, 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 the commentary coming back from that industry is that they've got work lined up to a certain point. Um, most people are sort of saying around October, November, it's post, post that period where the work sort of dries up. You know, there's not much in the pipeline or people have put it on hold or stopped it altogether. That is when 
that industry is going to be particularly affected. Um, we obviously had the, the that stimulus package introduced for the construction industry as, as well around um, the $25,000, I think it was for um, uh, stimulus for spending on home renovations. Um, we saw back in GFC, there was uh, money pumped into the construction industry. There was, as a result of that, um, the industry was quite liquid. Um, there was plenty of work around. There was actually a huge increase in the number of companies and businesses that started up in that industry. However, what we saw is two years later, there was a significant increase in, in company um, failures, business failures, as the work basically ran out from that stimulus and there was this glut of um, companies operating in, in that industry. So it will be interesting to see if, that, if something similar happens in the construction industry. Again, um, coming back to one of the terms we used earlier, flattening the insolvency curve, if you can push off, if you can push back or kick down the road, certain industries being affected at different times to other industries, um, it puts less pressure on not only um, the economy and, and the government to, to, to deal with that and um, assist that industry, but also importantly, the insolvency um, practitioner market, so to speak, that industry um, themselves with such a, a decrease in the number of administrations taking place, they've been affected significantly with you know, plenty of people being stood down, made redundant or put on JobKeeper. So they're certainly, I would say, under-resourced if there was to be a sudden increase in, um, in administrations taking place. So looking at <clears throat> payment times. Now, certainly these are painting a, a grim picture here when you're looking at industry to industry Comparing it to you know this time last year, I think I've got the next graph is a is is June 2019 versus 2020. Now we're pulling this payment information from customers that either connect their zero and MYOB accounting platform, allowing us to see you know how businesses are paying in specific industries, um, or larger organisations will who don't use zero or MYOB will upload a copy of their um, age trial balance, and again similar sort of um, data, we're able to aggregate that, anonymize it and look at it on an industry basis. So we've seen on average in, in July, businesses are paying, were paying 44 days late. Um, this figure was just 13 days at the same time last year. So a huge increase there. Slowest industries and they, none of these industries generally show on our on our you know our typical small business risk review when we look at payment times transport postal and warehousing financial and insurance services and then administrative and support services as well so here's a bit of a snapshot for you to see the large increase um, in payment times that, that, that are taking place across each industry so you'll see some good news stories coming out of agriculture, forestry and, and fishing and also mining. Um, manufacturing, while it's gone up quite a bit, you know, anything that's sort of 30 days and below is, is, not, um, is not such a bad result given the current climate. Um, so certainly not all terrible, but, but uh, the vast majority is, is fairly, um, fairly negative news coming out of the payment times. And we know that the payment times is that leading indicator of delinquency of a company that is really struggling. Cash flow issues often lead to defaults, court actions, and ultimately administration. So the big question will be, and I sort of touched on it earlier, is will these will these companies that are you know really struggling from a cash flow perspective that were that we're okay heading into COVID? Will, will they skip the payment default court action stage and head you know, straight to either VA or you know, some sort of administration down the track? Um, and then of course, you've got those ones that are probably not necessarily trading um, the, the, the so-called hibernators or zombie businesses that keep getting used in, in the press. Um, how will they react when JobKeeper payments are reduced and or insolvency safe harbour legislation comes to an end in September. So what's next? As I touched on, most important thing for me when it comes to company insolvencies is that safe harbour 
supervision end date. Um, the Treasurer touched on it last week or two weeks ago. I think it was reported on last week that they are reviewing it. Um, I think calls will grow for that to be um, extended. Otherwise, um, that job keeper that job keeper um, extension will be somewhat redundant for um, most companies out there. It simply won't be enough to continue to trade. Stimulus packages, as we know, have been extended, but will un will eventually come to an end. Um, and this is certainly also going to play a big role in triggering insolvencies. The big thing coming out of ASIC and the banks and a lot of businesses is we cannot continue to throw good money at bad businesses. Unfortunately, um, companies are going to fail and they, they, they need to be allowed to fail at, at, at a certain stage. It, it does sound harsh, it does sound negative, but the government and taxpayers cannot continue to throw money at businesses that potentially don't have a future at all. By reducing the number of companies out there that are on um, some sort of you know, financial life support, whether it's from the government or um, from the lenders, by reducing the number, it then allows the government and the lenders to start looking at their, their companies on a case-by-case -case basis and actually assessing them with a little bit more insight and, and education. When we have so many businesses out there that are being supported, um, it means that some good ones are going to fall through the cracks, ones that maybe need a little bit more support for six to 12 months. But if they can't be looked at closely, they will ultimately end up failing um, when other businesses should be failing potentially ahead of them. For business owners, directors that are struggling out there, they need to put their hand up. It's really important that they reach out and get um, advice. It doesn't have to be from their bank. It can be from their accountant. It could be from a restructuring specialist, um, insolvency practitioner, even liquidators. Um, there's plenty of evidence out there to suggest that early intervention is a much, much better way going forward and a much, you're much more likely to save your business than waiting until the very last minute when um, there's very little that can be done. So that is something for businesses and, and their directors out there to think about. For, for those in, you know, in the collection and credit space, it is certainly something that you should be encouraging um, your, your debtors as well to, to think about or engage with. Um, ultimately, you want to see them continue to um, survive into the future and past this, this period of recession. Um, you want customers buying your, your goods and services. So if you can assist them to, to get through this stage, then, then, then that is obviously beneficial for your company. Job creation, um, pressure will certainly continue to mount on the government to support job creation. There's going to be a huge number of skilled and motivated workers out there that, that want to contribute, that want jobs. Um, that will that will certainly grow as we get closer to job keeper and job seeker stimulus packages being reduced down to their, their new numbers, their new their new amounts in October. Um, and, and naturally we are going to see um, an increase in um, unemployment from that period onwards as employers let employees go due to the, that reduction. Preference payments is something that you know we've been contacted about a lot. It's been discussed in industry. It's been discussed by the media a few times in the last couple of weeks. Current situation is business as usual coming out of both the government and ASIC. However, there are certainly calls to clarify whether there will be changes or to at least um, investigate whether changes um, are, are needed. There's certainly arguments on both sides that um, suggest that they should be changes. The, the question is, if you introduce changes, does it does it does it introduce more questions? You know, it's certainly a complicated um, uh, process or, or or legislation to to deal with in normal times. Um, you know, there are, there are people being served or being receiving preference claims at the moment, so. Um, is it possible to introduce a you know no no preference claims for payments received during COVID times when when people are already um, most likely um, incurring those uh, those claims as we speak? Um, so this will be a, a a watch this space type of arrangement. 
Um, we know that um, some of the articles that have been written have certainly gained attention in the right places with government. Um, there are industry bodies out there pushing the case, so that's great to see. So it'll be interesting to see how that continues, um, how that continues to be addressed in the coming months. And then a big one out of the Australian Small Business Family um, Enterprise Ombudsman, Kate Carnell released her report into the insolvency space, insolvency industry, particularly looking at you know, small businesses. She came out with a number of changes, including you know, providing vouchers for small businesses to go to liquidators um, you know, for them to assess you know, a restructure of their business, for example. Um, bringing down the cost of you know, administration liquidation, um, making changes that suit a small business. At the moment, a small business is treated exactly the same as a large corporate. We just know that there's significant differences between businesses of those sizes. Um, so again, something else to keep an eye on to see if anything will change. Um, reporting season is, is upon us um, and financial reporting entities are being reminded or warned that they shouldn't be using stimulus revenue from things like JobKeeper to inflate the health of their company. So it will be interesting to see how that is reported on and whether anyone is called out on it. And the final thing I want to mention here is, um, I've just written it fairly simply, don't look more than two weeks ahead. Now, I'm not saying not to plan for the future, certainly not what I'm saying. However, we're in a space, we're in an environment that is changing so quickly at the moment. You know, we look at um, where we were at the beginning of March versus the end of March and how quickly um, corona came along and the infection rate increased and government obviously had to introduce um, you know, changes and, 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 and legislation and, and insolvency, uh, sorry, uh, stimulus packages. We, we, we look like we were coming out of it towards, you know, the beginning of, of June and very quickly we saw that Victoria has been um, adversely affected and, and the numbers of infections down there have continued to rise and as a result, you know, last night went into stage four lockdown and that happened quickly, you know. The general sentiment in the in the community, um, both as a consumer and a company, it looked it looked like we had, had seen the seen the worst of it. Um, but I'll put it behind us, and then all of a sudden, bang! We were reminded that we're in the middle of a a pandemic of an, uh, an extremely infectious and fast spreading um, uh, illness. Um, you know, we used to get our, our small business risk review data on a quarterly basis. We then moved it to, to monthly. Um, I now get it weekly, but to be honest, you know, I could almost get it on a daily basis. The way that things are changing so quickly is, um, is tremendous. Um, the, the, the need for data to understand what is happening in almost real time is extremely important. So um, there's obviously the ability to plan more than two weeks ahead. Um, but you certainly want to be able to change direction, pivot, adjust um, when things do change quickly, as we have seen um, throughout the last six months. Now, of course, um, we have our Economic Road Ahead playbook that we've just released this morning. You can get it online. Um, actually, I think everyone who is attending or registered for this webinar will receive it in a follow-up email. So you don't have to go and download it, but you can if you want. Um, a huge amount of advice, data analysis, commentary um, throughout this um, throughout this playbook that has been put together. And I'll just jump in and give you a really quick squeeze, 13 pages, plenty of content for you to make your way through. I hope I haven't used up too much of it in the webinar itself, um, but there's plenty of insights for you. So that will be sent through to you. If you've got more questions about it or it doesn't come through, you can jump onto the website. Um, you'll see here a nice new section on our homepage, download now, takes you to a page to download it. If you can't wait for that email to come through in the next 24 hours, by all means, jump in and grab it. That takes us to the end of the webinar today. Of course, if there's any questions outside of what you may have put in the GoToWebinar control panel, um, please don't be shy. Please do get in contact. Um, and I will just jump in and have a look at 
some of the questions that have come through now. Um, quick, quick question here around um, sector. Um, good stats, any view of size of enterprise by sector, i.e. are the big places taking longer to pay because they can or is it general by sector? That's a really good question. Look, something we've come to realise is that our data is great, but we can certainly delve deeper into it. We want to be able to by the end of the year, look at things like business size. We want to delve deeper than just state. We want to look at a, you know, almost a postcode by postcode basis. Um, and of course, across the industry and all of the insights like payment faults, court actions, et cetera. Um, I, look, there's plenty of argument out there. There's plenty of discussion out there about big businesses taking too long to pay. Kate Carnell at the Ombudsman, Small Business Family Ombudsman has been extremely active in that space. In, in putting pressure on you know, big enterprise to pay on time or within a certain period of time. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not gonna sort of necessarily make a comment around that. I think you know, if businesses are struggling, they are. Um, I don't, I, I, would, I would suggest, however, that large, large corporations would not be taking advantage of COVID just because it is so sensitive, sensitive at the moment, it would be an absolute PR risk if they were um, to be found out. Um, question around um, expected Phoenix activity. Look, we know that in times of crisis, there are people out there that take advantage of that. ASIC and the insolvency and the insolvency industry are going to be run off their feet eventually with when, when the increase in administrations take place. And as a result of that, there won't necessarily be as much um, investigation and um, you know microscopic sort of looking into business failures and, and related party transactions and whatnot. I'm not saying liquidators won't do it; it certainly will. But it is much easier for for, for um, instances of you know fraud and, and illegal phoenix activity to fall through the cracks. So the big big um, part of identifying those falls on on, on you guys, on predators, to make sure that you know you are having a look. And if something you know walks like a duck, talks like a duck, looks like a duck, it most likely is an illegal phoenix. Um, so there is a the phoenix task force and hotline to flag with ASIC um, and at least then it is on record and, and hopefully results in some sort of investigation. Um, there's a couple more here that I will get to separately. I'm obviously conscious of time and also specifics around of that. Um, we will, we will certainly be doing follow-up um, webinars to this. Um, there is plenty more information coming out on a regular basis, not just within our own data and insights, but of course, out of the government and ASIC too. Um, I spoke with ASIC only a couple of weeks ago and they are very keen to start getting their data, uh, providing more data insights via their website and also more timely as well, because it generally can be a couple of months behind and they know that there's a need to get that information out much sooner. So they are working on that, which is great. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone um, for joining today. Um, I hope you're staying, staying safe and sanitised out there, particularly down um, in Victoria. Thoughts with everyone down there doing it tough back down in those, um, you know, quite harsh lockdown that's going on down there. So all the best with that. Hang in there. We will all get through this. At, one stage or another. Um, but thanks again, and I will see you guys again soon.